right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Robin Strongen, the president of Amplify Public Affairs, and I want to welcome everybody. I know it's the end of the conference, so thank you for um, keeping up with us. Um, this panel is Health IT Rebooting the Healthcare System, and we have a very distinguished uh, group of Oh, turn off all cell phones. You want me to make an announcement? Please turn off all cell phones, pagers, et cetera, because they are taping. So um, we're going to hear first from Zoe Baird, who is the president of the Markle Foundation. And then she'll be followed by Adam Bosworth, founder and CEO of Kiosk. And then, um, obviously, we have uh, not Dean, who had to leave early, but we have the privilege of hearing from Esther Dyson, who, um, as many of you know, has been very involved in IT and has now transitioned, not completely out of IT, but IT as it relates to healthcare. And so I think we're going to have an incredible discussion this morning. What I'd like to do before we begin is frame this discussion by taking some of the recurring themes that I heard throughout the four days and tie them to HIT. In virtually every session that at least I sat in on, I heard five similar themes, all of which related back to HIT in one way or another. The first was the promise of HIT, very broadly defined. The second was the need for better and more, more data, whether it was for comparative effectiveness research, food safety surveillance, payment incentives, system efficiency improvements, and so forth. Over and over, we need more information, we need more data. Then we heard in just about every single session the absolute necessity of empowering patients. And with that, we heard that IT can help achieve all of our health goals, not just for the system, but for individuals looking to improve their health outcomes. So that's a tall order for um, HIT, but I think that after this panel, we may have some, some insights on how we do that. What we're going to hear about is um, a particular focus <laughs> on meaningful use and the all popular data. Access to it, who should have access to it, the privacy and security of it, as well as what we do with it. And much of those conversations right now, particularly inside the Beltway, really revolve around the physicians and the hospitals or health systems, not so much the nurses, not so much the patients. And frankly, um, much of the stimulus um, package is about, in reference to uh, health information technology, is authorizing CMS to provide financial incentives for eligible phys uh, physicians who meaningfully use HIT. And those payments, those incentive payments begin in 2011 for eligible Medicare physicians. And those who have not demonstrated meaningful use will be penalized with a 1% reduction in their Medicare payments starting in 2015. But if we're ever going to get to where I've heard us collectively say we need to be, which is to empower patients and to improve health, we really have to be mindful of how we include patients in that equation. And that leads to the fifth recurring theme that I heard, which was if we're ever going to get there, it really isn't just about health care in a vacuum. If we don't do education, if we don't do nutrition, if we don't have a support system, we're not going to be able to improve health and health care. And I would remind everybody we have a Secretary of Health and Human Services, and it's the human services that we need to be focused on just as much as health. And what that has to do, in my opinion, with um, this whole topic is we have a, a large percentage of the population for whom health literacy is an issue and the digital divide is an issue. And until we incorporate all of those things, whether we're talking about IT where patients are looking for information, where there's uh, social media and people are grassroots activists looking to make changes in healthcare, whether it's electronic medical records, however you define HIT, without the patient being empowered and being an integral part of that, I don't know that we'll get to where we want to be. I would just mention one report that came out of ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, back in November 2008. It was entitled, um, let's see, Barriers and Drivers of Health Information Technology Use for the Elderly, Chronically Ill and Underserved. And what they found was that opportunities afforded uh, health IT are not equally available to everyone. Both researchers and policymakers have attempted to understand and remedy the link between health disparities and internet access. 
Those who most need health information often lack the means, knowledge, and skills necessary to benefit from Internet resources. One significant barrier to the use of Internet health is consumer access. And I will leave you with this quote, which I think is just terrific as we then segue into the panel. And this was something that Bill Kennard, the former chairman of the FCC, said several years ago when he was invited to give the commencement address at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And he reminded us that, and this is his quote, 35 years ago, President Johnson stood here and delivered a landmark address on civil rights. He said those now famous words, you cannot take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race and then say you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. What Lyndon Johnson said 35 years ago is even more true today because today the race is being run on internet time. The racetrack is a global network of fiber optic lines, broadband cables, and wireless connections over which ones and zeros race at internet speed. Those who start behind will stay behind, and this race runs so fast that they will never catch up. And we are already off to an uneven start. Blacks and Hispanics are only 40% as likely as whites to have internet access at home. I believe that ensuring that all Americans have access to technology is the civil rights challenge of this new millennium. We will not meet this challenge until all of our children are as interested in becoming Michael Dell as they are in becoming Michael Jordan, when they would rather have the latest laptops than the latest high tops. And with that, I'm going to turn the conversation over to our panelists. We'll hear first from Zoe, who's been very instrumental and very active with the discussions on HIT, the efforts um, on, around defining um, meaningful use and so forth. Then we're going to hear from Adam, who's, who's going to take us somewhat outside the internet, or the internet, the, inside the beltway, out into the real world where we have um, electronic medical records. And how will they work? Will they work in the practice of medicine? Not, not all physicians are part of the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic. In fact, they're small businesses with a small number of people. So how is this supposed to happen? And then we will hear from Esther, who is going to um, talk to us about whether or not IT can do for healthcare what it did for politics. So with that, let me turn it over to Zoe. Thank you. Uh, the three of us are such good friends and have worked together for so long that it would probably be a lot more fun if we just challenged each other and threw away what we planned to say. <laughs> but uh, also, I would note that there are several of you in the audience who know as much about this topic as those of us up here and ought to be on the panel. So you'll have to bear with us a little bit because we've been asked to provide uh, context for the discussion for those who are not as informed. So I apologize in advance to those of you who could be uh, giving this uh, conversation or leading the conversation. Um, You've been hearing the last few days that the health reform debate in Washington is focused on bringing the 47 million uninsured into the health care insurance system and controlling costs as um, health care costs have spiraled to $2.4 trillion or 17% of U.S. GDP. And for that, the United States is ranked number 37 in the world in the provision of health care to its people. So we have been grappling in the Washington context with uh, tremendously rising health care costs but not rising health care quality. Robin alluded to the American Recovery uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act, which the stimulus package, which took the first step toward addressing these issues by um, including a $40 billion investment in health information technology. Now, what's the context for this? It probably doesn't surprise you if you think back to your last visit to the doctor, particularly a doctor you hadn't been to before, and you walked in the door and you're handed a clipboard and a pen. If you could imagine that happening, if you walked into a bank and a teller handed you a clipboard and a pen and said, write down what you want to take out and what you think you have in the bank, um, and that was their way of, of collecting information on you or storing information on you, you'd be pretty horrified. But that's the state of healthcare today. 17% of GDP 
but very little adoption of health information technology. In much of the country, it's no more than 8% of doctors who have any kind of use of the internet in their practice or other electronic records. And hospitals really aren't much better. And the information that one hospital has can't be transported to another hospital electronically. So if you're in a car accident, there's no way they can get your records and know whether you're allergic to aspirin or whether you um, are on medications or whatever. So um, we also have a context where the government spends 40% of healthcare dollars and yet has made no investment in health information technology. So the $40 billion in the Recovery Act is really intended to be a stimulus and accelerator of the adoption of health information technology. Now, the government usually procures information technology in um, ways that have not been really very successful. If you look at the FBI or the fact that we can't prosecute people in Guantanamo because we can't connect the information that the military intelligence is connected with what the FBI has collected, um, it has not been a place where um, adoption of, of, health inform of, of information technology has really been very successful. So what many of us are working on is to try to avoid the old traps of large procurements, focus on standards, um, focus on buying technology, and instead are trying to get the government to focus on what it's trying to achieve and how information technology can be a tool in achieving that. You know, it's one thing to say we're going to make the country safer by putting 100,000 more cops on the street, but we're not going to improve health care by putting 100,000 more electronic medical records in the hands of doctors. We have to really understand what we want doctors to do with those records. And so this isn't just a matter of procuring technology, but rather what are our national goals for the use of information technology. And I'd like to offer in a collaborative that Adam's a part of and Esther's a part of and several of you in the room are a part of, um, has proposed that what we really ought to be focused on are the healthcare outcomes that we seek. How are we actually going to improve the health of Americans? So we believe we can reduce um, strokes and heart disease in this country um, radically by use of health information technology. Um, we're looking at encouraging the government to set goals like reducing the racial disparities in diabetes management through health information technology. And if we set these kinds of concrete health improvement goals, then innovators like Adam, people like Esther who are worrying about consumers and patient access to technology and privacy issues, all can understand what uh, they're working toward. And collectively, um, we can achieve these goals. And in the q and A, I I can go into a lot of specifics about how we do that. Um, I, I'd also like to suggest that we understand what the most important health improvement goals are in the country. So we don't need to engage in a large debate about whether heart disease comes first or, or some other illness. We know in this country that um, over half of Americans suffer from chronic conditions, heart disease and stroke, diabetes, asthma, or cancer. And if we went after those four chronic conditions, it's over 75% of health care costs and over 70% of deaths. So we can focus on improving those particular conditions. And we also know not only what we should focus on in terms of health improvement, but we know how to approach those problems, and health information technology has a great deal to do in approaching those problems. For example, and I can give you many other examples in the Q&A session if you want, but Group Health Cooperative in Seattle, which I was a product of when I grew up in that system, so that's why I'll use their example. Um, group Health decided it was going to go after um, blood pressure management, because we know that if people can manage their blood pressure, you can significantly reduce um, the mortality and complications from any kind of heart disease, um, any kind of cardiovascular disease. And so uh, they, through a process of developing a feedback loop between the patients and the pharmacists online, 
were able to double the number of patients who were managing and maintaining their blood pressure at appropriate levels. So the very simple use of the internet as it exists has tremendous health improvement benefits. And the last thing I'd say about this is that these health improvement benefits will then reduce complications, reduce the more expensive procedures, so it's all of a piece with reducing health costs as well and managing the cost equation. So I'd like to leave you um, thinking about how you can participate in our reform of health care and enabling us to bring more people into the system without the cost spiral um, becoming prohibitive through very clear focus and priority on improving the health of Americans, particularly chronic conditions, through the use of existing straightforward um, information technology tools. Thanks. Great, thanks. Adam? So first let me thank Zoe for the astonishing things that Zoe and the Markle Foundation have done. <coughs> I am. Um, I don't know if everyone in the room understands how valuable a role the Markle Foundation played in the meaningful use outcomes and the documents that came out. Many of us were afraid that they would be very bad and stifle innovation or focus on the wrong things. We spent a lot of time in D.C. Um, talking to the Markle Foundation about it, and they were very effective. I'm not saying they were the only ones, but the documents that came out were very good, and we were vastly relieved. Um, that being said, let me make three points about IP and what's going on in D.C. and meaningful use. As you correctly said, we spend 70 percent of our health care costs on those diseases, the diabetes, the strokes, the heart disease, asthma, and so on. What's interesting to think about is that most of those costs are due to lifestyle-related choices. The, um, and for those of you who don't know, and I think everyone here does, there has been an epidemic explosion in obesity in this country in the last 20 years. If you look at the rate of obesity in this country in 1986 and compare it to now, it's almost unrecognizable. And as someone who's old enough to remember, I was born in 55, my mental image of an adult is just thinner than an adult is today because of this. The, um, when I was a kid, if your waist was over 34, you, you know, your doctor said it was time to lay off the ice cream. And it's the rare adult in this country right now, male, who has a waist of 34. So it's just been a sea change. And that has led to most of these costs. Or put differently, if we don't change people's lifestyles, we could spend all the health IT we want, and we're not going to help out very much. Um, and so that's a key point. And I, I admit to having a bias, because my company's job is to go, go out and try and give people the tools to be healthier. But it's worth noting that without that, these costs aren't going to improve. The second thing and this is, I think, a beltway versus non-beltway discussion, is about incentives. If you look at health IT and you say the goal is to create more data, you, are not, you have not created an incentive for the small practice. And if you do not create an incentive for the small practice, they will not use it. They will not use it because they're under the gun. The average primary care physician has increased their caseload 30 percent in the last 10 years only by basically seeing patients for fewer and fewer minutes because it's the only thing that I had to give. They're under the gun. They've actually not increased their income at all. They've done that to keep them paced. They're running on ice. And if you give them something that takes more time per patient and the only incentive is data is being generated that basically they fear will be used to criticize the way they practice medicine, they will not use it. They might install it, but they will not use it. And because of this, we said when we were in D.C. talking to the Markle Foundation about meaningful use, you could argue that the only really meaningful use we needed was to make sure that the data went to the patient. So the patient had the tools to actually get healthier. And it's worth noting that today the patients do not have that data. They, the labs do. When you go in and take a lab test or a test at Quest Diagnostics, they have that data electronically. If you go to lab core, they have the data electronically. Any pharmacy has the data electronically because they all wanted to be paid. Any imaging company has electronically for the same reason. The doctors do not. 80% of those doctors do not use health IT, and yet the laws preclude you from getting the data from the people who actually have it. You must get it from your doctor, but you can't get it from your doctor. You can't get it from your doctor 
because they have no health IT. So you have this terrible tap turned off. So quite frankly, many of us in the industry viewed the health IT bill as sufficient if meaningful use if it simply turned the tap on. If the doctor did nothing more than say, I now approve the flow of data from my patients. Because then at least the data would start to flow. The second point I'm going to make is if you uh, really want to actually affect doctors in using this, you need to figure out what helps them. And what helps them is not the classic EMR that has been delivered by Epic or Cerner into the hospitals. Those tools are just not suitable for a small practice. What helps a small practice is saving them time or earning them more money per patient. And that's what they want. They want more time per patient. They want more money per patient. Or at least they want more quality time per patient. If they have 12 minutes per patient, they don't want to spend six minutes on a medical history and three minutes on, on education, leaving them at best three minutes for diagnosis. They'd rather spend six minutes on diagnosis than six minutes talking to the patient. Or maybe even save two minutes, because as I said, they're under the gun. So if we're going to build meaningful use, we're going to have to ask, start by asking ourselves, what actually helps a small practice? And bear in mind, something like 80% of the doctors in this country are in 10 or under physician practices. Tom would have better data on that than I would. But most practices are small, which is why most doctors are not using IT. The cost is a shibboleth. Um, Washington offered up an enormous amount of money because the industry told them it would take an enormous amount of money. And the industry told them that because they were describing technology which hasn't been relevant in any other industry for the last 15 years. It was basically like describing to you, you should go buy a Model T. And by the way, the Model T will cost you $100,000. Please, as a government, give me the money for $100,000 Model Ts. That's not how we do business anywhere else in this industry. The way we do business anywhere else in the industry is we build on-demand systems where the cost per user is, is trivial. Salesforce went out and eviscerated a company called Siebel because in the customer and the sales support business using exactly this technology. Now, why is it that the health industry hasn't adopted health IT like this when every other industry has? It's because they have no incentives. They are not paid by the consumer. And that's the key point that's getting missed here. And unless they have an incentive, they actually earn more money by using the health IT. They won't use it. They might install it, but they won't use it. And that data you think will flow will not flow. The improvements in care that you think will happen that are described and overtreated will not happen because there's no incentive. So fundamentally, you know, the first argument I would make is there has to be incentives. And the funny thing is the cost of actually delivering these EMRs to these doctors is trivial. Most of us in the industry will tell you if you gave us a billion dollars a year, we would be ecstatic. We would earn a fortune on that, delivering these systems, because we wouldn't deliver them using Model T technology. We would deliver them using 21st century technology. And at that point, our cost per practice would be a couple of thousand dollars at most. But the reason it would be a couple of thousand dollars at most is we would make it a self-serve product. It would not be this huge bells and whistles, 35 dials, 25 knobs to turn product. And for the small practice, that's the only thing they could use anyway, because it's the only thing they could learn and use and adopt. And that kind of product is, is very cheap to build and very cheap to deliver online. And so the actual cost, again, is not the real issue. Frankly, if I were DC, and I've said this in speeches, I would have taken that same 20 to 40 billion, and I would have used 19 to 39, depending on which number you want to count, as incentives, and left 1 billion for the vendors to go sell EMRs to the practices. And it would have worked out just as well, it would have worked out far better, because now the practices would have had an incentive to use these products. And that incentive would have been measured in terms of payments for patients who got healthier. It would, and the simplest thing here would be weight. You know, before, you know, the, the second thing is we say we don't have enough data. We have enough data. We know exactly why heart disease has gone up so much. We know exactly why diabetes has gone up so much. We know exactly even why cancer to some degree has gone up so much. It's because people aren't living healthy lifestyles. They're not eating right and they're not exercising. And there's, they're, you know, they're not managing their stress well. This is not rocket science. It's only cancers where we don't have enough data to know which medicine we should give you based on the cancer and some very rare diseases. And that is not why most people are dying. There's a couple of small anomalies. We spend way too much for people in the last six months of their life against their will because we forcibly hospitalize them because otherwise they're not covered. When the vast majority of them would rather go home and get home care, at one-tenth the cost. And it's actually a lot of money. We spend a surprising amount of money. But it's still not that much compared to what we're talking about. If you're right in life, those diseases are 70%. 
then lifestyle represents 70% of $2.5 billion. 70% of $2.5 billion is $1.8 billion, give or take. Or put differently, it's about $6 billion a, a day. And that's where the real money is going. And so if we simply pour the money there, we solve the problem. So what I really think we should be doing in terms of defining meaningful use is simply defining meaningful use as A, the data can flow to the patients because the patients will have an incentive to use it, and then B, focus on an appropriate incentive model for people to actually get paid for being healthier, both the patients and the doctors. So every time the doctor actually improves the health, healthiness of one of their patients, they get some incentive. And you might say that's not practical. Well, let's just imagine we only had $20 billion to spend. $20 billion, we pick the 40 million sickest, most overweight, most unhealthy Americans who are going to cost a huge chunk of that money, and we pay them $500 a piece in incentives. That's what $20 billion is times 40 million people. Well, um, if we did that, we have very hard data that they would change their lifestyles, particularly the people we're talking about, because it's been tried in companies, and when they do that, the compliance rates go from 10% to 20, I mean to 60 to 70%. Because for that group of people, $500 is real money. So, you know, what, I, what I'm saying is not, not that the meaningful use, the meaningful use criteria are perfect. I'm saying the best way to achieve the outcomes that meaningful use wants is not by installing a classic EMR in every practice. It's by installing something useful in the practice where the data can flow and then installing an incentive system to reward people for better, healthier patients. Thank you. Thanks. When, when Zoe said we we all know each other. I was thinking we should really just give each other's talks. It would have been <laughs> more, more interesting, certainly, for us. But uh, what I'd like to do is go even further away from the Beltway and everything else, and, and second Adam's comments about Zoe's work, yeah, where the big institutions are, as far as I'm concerned, ga engaging in some kind of a death struggle. Uh, some of them may survive. Death struggles don't mean the death of everybody, but it's, it's a mess. Uh, from my perspective, what's really interesting is both the empowerment of the patient, which I'll talk about in a few moments, but the empowerment of the consumer. You heard about the clipboard and, and the analogy of taking it into the bank. There's, there's another great analogy I heard from a guy called Ed Liu at Google. Suppose you went to the grocery store tomorrow, and you're a reasonably conscientious person. You, you have some notion of which things are expensive and which aren't, and which things are healthy and which aren't. But nothing, nothing is labeled. No prices and no ingredients, no, none of the data that you've, you've gotten used to. So you try and do a good job. You pick what you think you need, and you try not to spend too much money. And then two or three months later, you get a bill. This bill has lots of detail, but it's completely incomprehensible. That's what buying medical care is like now. In addition, you don't even pay the bill. But it's, to me, half of the interesting information is not even the medical information, but simply the, the information about what it is you're buying as a user of health care. And I agree with somebody who said yesterday, when you need a heart operation, you probably are not informed enough as a consumer. But when when you're buying, quote, regular health care, when you're, when you're operating in general, picking hospitals, picking all these other things, there's no, the market is not working. There may be some price competition, but there's no competition on the basis of anything that anybody cares about. One of the most exciting things that's going to happen over the next few years is that this kind of information is going to become available. Doctors are going to be rated. Hospitals are going to be rated. The quality, the statistics, all this kind of stuff is going to come out. Consumers will have access to it. Doctors will have access to it. Employers and insurance companies will all have access to it. And that alone, I think, is going to help a lot. It's not going to solve all our problems, but it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be pouring some oil on those gears that have been rusting for so long. And suddenly... People are going to know more about the systems and services and, and providers that they're engaging with. And I, I think that's going to help a lot no matter what this health reform bill is like. If, if I were doing it, I would have 
basically people would start paying for their own health care and then they would have the equivalent of a high deductible health insurance plan. But I don't know if that's going to happen. I do know that there's going to be a lot more visibility and transparency about what it is they're getting. The second thing that to me is really interesting is the availability of data to individuals about themselves. Adam sort of touched on it, and now I will give his talk because <laughs> <laughs> he was one of the leading people behind something called healthdatarights.org. How many of you have heard of that? Okay. It's my, as you heard, my talk, such as it is, was going to be called What Can the Internet Do for Healthcare, similar to what it did for politics. Healthdatarights.org is one of these sites that doesn't really have a budget. It has a few contributors. It's a declaration of rights of individuals to data about themselves. And it, it doesn't wade into these extremely complex and freighted discussions about the privacy of the data, but the access of the individual to their own data. Whether from my perspective, uh, your genetic data, I'm on the board of 23andMe, your lab data from Quest and LabCorp, uh, ultimately your data from your doctor, which of course is the last to go because it usually is not electronic. And when we start getting hold of that data, we're going to discover exactly how inaccurate it is. Uh, some of the inaccuracies are mistakes. Some are deliberate misdiagnoses because your doctor's a nice person and wants you to get reimbursed for something. I think there was an epidemic of diabetes-related foot complications because you could get various podiatry services done if they were a result of diabetes, but not if they were just other things wrong with your feet. Uh, everybody's heard of patient Dave and all his misdiagnoses. That's going to change consumers. I think it's going to change everything for consumers. It's not going to reach down to the bottom third, where I would argue the problem is even less access to computers, but simply literacy and, and care and so forth and so on. But caring about um, the, the putting of the data in the patient's hands is going to change enough people's lives and behavior and demands on the system that it's going to change what people who are not as much activists are going to get. And I think in that way, it's, it's very much like politics. You have the leading edge, the activists, and they change the system for the other people. I just joined this panel very late, so I don't have a whole lot of prepared remarks, and I'm going to leave it at that. And I think we are going to have a very interesting discussion. All right, so you've heard from all three. I'd like to just really open it up to all of you, but when you do make a statement or ask a question, if you could just identify yourself in the back. Oh, and then Sally after that. I'd make, I'd make one short comment before Adam. Yeah, I'll make one broad comment and Adam can bore into it. But um, in this country in the last 15 years, more jobs have been created in small businesses than in Fortune 500 companies by a radical order of magnitude. And in part, that's enabled by the internet and the ability for people to both do uh, purchasing through the internet as well as address customers and find customers and deal with customers through the internet. Um, so I don't think that the problem 
is the, and also, by the way, most doctors have some relationship to a hospital or a, a, a larger concentrated um, medical center. So I don't think that's the problem with the Internet. Adam, you might. Well, <clears throat> I'm sitting here looking at Tom Morrison sitting in front of me <clears throat> of Navinet, and 700,000 providers have access to his software online, if I'm correct. And the problem is not access. I mean, at the end of the day, the problem is that they have no reason to use these tools that are getting built. And the academic medical centers do because they're busy getting paid for that integrated level of care and service. If, unless, the, 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 the problem isn't access. And, and, you know, Tom's kind of an extreme case because he actually delivers these, and I think the total cost to all those doctors combined is zero. But, um, <laughs> but even if it were a billion dollars, that, you know, that, that's not the challenge. So... Uh, there are plenty of analysts. I mean, as Zoe correctly said, most businesses are small. And so, for example, most, uh, if you look at people who sell as opposed to people who cure, most people who sell are in small businesses. And that was how the company Salesforce came to be. They figured out that they should deliver a tool that was cost effective and trivial to use for the small businesses. Um, Clay Christensen, who's these days turned his attention to health, wrote a book a long time ago called An Innovator's Dilemma. And he pointed out that the tools that solve the problem for the low end are not the same as the tools that solve the problem for the high end, except that they tend to grow once they're built. And someday, one day you discover they've eaten out the heart of the business, and actually it's only the very high end that would still use the old tools. That's the place we're in with hospitals right now versus these small practices. You know, the tool that a Beth Israel deaconess will use, or the tool even that Kaiser will use, is just not the same tool. I see um, Stefan disagreeing with me, but it's... Is not the same tool that a three person practice can or should use. And honestly, th th this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. There is a reason why Salesforce was able to sell those people. You have to go and look at these folks and say, what can we do to help you and build a tool for them, which is pretty much what Tom did. And if you do that, I mean, for example, virtually every one of those small practices has a computer. You know what they use it for? It's called practice management. Why? Because they wanted to be paid. Um, and because they wanted to be paid, they figured out how to use a computer. You know, at the end of the day, if you ask yourself, what can we do for these physicians? And why would it be in their interest to have anything about their patient online electronically, anything about their health? Then they would do it. One last quick comment before I give it to us. I went out when I was at Google Health and I asked every doctor I could find, what do they want to know about a patient if they can only know one thing? And every doctor, almost without exception, said meds. And I said, okay, now imagine you get two things. And they said test results. I said, now imagine you have three things. They said, no, no, I don't know. And then they said, maybe lab, um, maybe EKGs. I said, they want all images? They went, no, no, just give me the EKGs right now. And then I got to the fourth thing. And by now, you know, they're, they're starting to look bored and look at their watches and want to go back to their practice. And then they would start to talk about the rest of the images or they would talk about the patient's condition as encoded by someone else. And I said, what about doctor's notes? And they just looked at me. Now think about that. Everything I just described up to the, about the condition is electronically available today. It's all there. The problem is not the data. The problem is not the evidence. The problem, the problem is access. You stole my next talk, by the way. <coughs> but, um, so I, I don't, there are plenty of al analogies. And every other analogy, what happened was there was an economic benefit to using an online system. And so they did. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to answer your, that same question quickly with two, two specific examples. Um, Salesforce.com, you've heard already, Intuit. In, back when uh, Adam was looking at all these thin grown-ups, I was going with my little paper passbook to my bank to get my account updated. And over time, consumers started using Quicken and first just to pay their checks, but then they said, gee, I'd like to get my data from my bank. And then they said, I'd like to get my data from multiple banks and from my brokerage account. And I'd like to be able to compare all these different amounts and manage it, not simply have the data, but actually have the data be liquid and be able to flow between accounts. So I think consumers are going to start demanding that same thing, either through their doctors or around their doctors. Tom, did you want to say something? Well, you know, Sort of interesting in this case, I think, is that for, for 
I think that's what we've done from a, a policy level. That's sort of what we've done. So the industry has had, the IT industry has had a very strong preconceived notion of what it is that we need to do to solve healthcare in a way that meets reality. And what, what's sort of interesting, let me, let me give you an example. I don't think that's really what we should be doing right now because what we're really doing is we're going to put a new infrastructure in place. Because this is not about an IT application. This is not about EMRs. This is really about an infrastructure that's going to have the kind of impact on our society that other massive infrastructure projects have had. Interstate highway system being a good example of that. So when we think about what is it that we want to do, and kind of to your question, if we can figure out a way, and I think we can, to be able to create an infrastructure that can facilitate innovation in the way that the internet has done, right? So imagine, for example, and again, kind of the infrastructure context. If the Department of Commerce in 1998 had said, you know what we need to do? This internet thing, this is really amazing. If we can get consumers to buy things on the internet, we could change our society and our economy. Let's go out and create a set of standards for the shopping carts. We'll put together this group that figures out what a shopping cart ought to look like. And generally, when you tell that story, people go, that, just, that makes no sense at all, because we've seen what happened by putting the right infrastructure in place. I think what we need to do in healthcare is the same thing. And I think it's starting to happen. The work that, that Zoe's done with Marco is, has really helped, because what's happening is, while there were preconceived notions in the industry of how to solve a problem, what Congress did with meaningful use um, and, the, and the office of the uh, national coordinator at HHS has done is laid out a set of what are the things that will be the outcomes that we're after for meaningful use. And what people are starting to recognize, and I've spent quite a bit of time in Washington and working with some of the people on the, on the policy committee there, is that there's this massive disconnect between those items and the industry's preconceived notions of how we should solve that problem. So I think there's reason for optimism, but I think it's important for all of us, and we've heard a lot here in this conference about the variability of individuals, the need for special groups. We have to make sure that we get an infrastructure in place that can support that variability. Great, thank you. There was a gentleman in the back over here. Yes, you and then Matt. Yeah, exactly, sure. Could you talk a little about the privacy issue in the Thank you. Go ahead, Esther. Okay. Yeah. All right, Esther um, has, wants to comment. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the issue is 
the real issue is not privacy, it's control. Uh, you should have the right to say, I don't want my records on that stinking internet. Keep them off. But you have to deal with the trade-off, which is worse care. If you're in the accident, they won't know your data, and they'll treat you as best they can. There is a risk to putting stuff in cyberspace. It's, it should be small. Companies should be accountable for the safety of your data, but there's a risk. There's a risk to everything you do. So first of all, by law, you should have the right to control that. Secondly, you should understand as a consumer that there's a small risk that people will inadvertently or on purpose break the law, and, and you're at risk for that. Then every care should be taken by all the systems to keep that information secure. Right now, we have really crappy password systems. We have very complicated allocations of authority so that most of this information doesn't move because people are terrified of breaking laws that they don't understand. So you have a completely illiquid system. But it should be up to the individual ultimately to say, I want to take that risk or I don't. Then you should also have the right to control which data is shared and which is not. But that's complicated. So there, there is no simple answer. The, the concepts are very clear, I think. The reality of it is going to be somewhat messy. You know, let, um, me, let me add one um, comment on this. And, you know, we've developed with a pretty broad collaboration of technologists like Adam and Esther and, and civil liberties and privacy advocates some detailed documents on how health information should be managed to protect privacy, and maybe they'd be useful to you. They're all on our website. But... Um, it, what the core of that is, is trying to um, maintain data where it currently resides so that you would still have the radiology data. You wouldn't send that off to big centralized databases. Rather, what's at the center are directories so that a hospital that's got you admitted as a patient will go to the directory and quickly find out what systems to query. So the information is more likely to be both accurate and up-to-date because it's maintained where it's been created. But there is also less risk of accumulated uh, databases on individuals uh, residing somewhere else. There's, so your radiology data might get released, but everything else about that person isn't in the same database, so it might not be. So there's no clearly no perfect answer. We do not have great security the way we've constructed the Internet, but um, there are some approaches that are helpful to provide greater assurance. But I think that um, we're not yet in a place where consumers feel comfortable creating electronic medical records on the Internet and, and that are comprehensive. And... Um, Esther's point about control, I think, is a, is a very important one. So you've asked the perfect question for a panel because you finally have elicited a disagreement. It is, <laughs> it's rare that I disagree with my esteemed colleagues on my left and my right, but I emphatically no, do disagree at this point um, with both of you. I want to make three points. Um, number one, the, in, the people who manage data in cyberspace, their business depends on that. If they get hacked, they're go broke. Um, so, for example, if Google, who manages people's health data, got ha their health data was hacked, the damage to Google would be almost incalculable in terms of brand and reputation. The average hospital, which routinely loses data because some employee sells it to someone who wants Medicare data or what have you, does not because people still need to go to that hospital and be treated. So the financial incentive to any single healthcare organization to manage your data securely and well is very low. This financial incentive that people who manage the data in cyberspace is almost incalculable. The expertise follows. The expertise that the average hospital has for managing your data securely is, is laughable for the average person in cyberspace, which is why they sometimes get hacked. Though it's still normally an inside job. Yeah, the, it's not technical expertise. Right. It's social. Right. It's they, they don't change, change passwords. They don't patch things. The average expertise, um, if you're Google, where literally a hacker is hitting you every second of every day trying to break in, and therefore you have built defenses up as thick as this table, 
is such that, for example, no one here has ever heard of anyone's personal data getting hacked from Google, period. Whereas, but Adam, you have heard of wait, wait, Iron Mountain I, I want to make my three points. I like to make Uh, we'll, we'll go back to that. Uh, the, the second, the, the normal problem Google has is reverse, which is if you forget your password, you lose your data because you can't get back to it. The second point I wanted to make about privacy was about the patient's rights. Um, and it goes back to Esther's comment that patient and your HIV comment, because your HIV comment is perfectly opposite for this discussion. If <clears throat> I have HIV and I go see a doctor about some completely unrelated activity, but where they might think HIV is relevant. Under HIPAA, that doctor has a right to my data. HIPAA does not actually give me any protection or privacy in terms of what I can control of my data. It simply says that I sign away. When I sign the HIPAA agreement, I am not saying I release the data. You know, I'm saying I understand that if you refer me to this doctor, they have all rights to my data. Now, patients may not want this. The HIPAA does not give them that. Conversely, the people who manage patients' data in cyberspace do give them that right. If you look at how Microsoft Health Vault, for example, manages people's data, Microsoft Health Vault gives you the ability to decide who can see what as a patient. Now, you, that may be a bad decision for you, as Esther said. It may be that you really should tell that doctor who's consulting about your HIV. But at least Microsoft Health Vault gives you that right, which the average, which, which the doctor, the hospitals legally cannot do. Right? We see this every day when, when doctors tell insurance companies things they don't want to, but they have to because of HIPAA. Basically, cyberspace has given patients far more protection of their data than hospitals, not far less, is my basic point, because A, they have the incentive, B, they have the expertise, and C, they've given them more control. And so, and then lastly, and this is where I wanted to disagree with, with Zoe, the, the, the tools that are you, if you leave the data where it is, almost no intelligent reasoning can be done about the data. If you pull the data together, and so, for example, most people may think that when you do a Google search, Google will go out to every site on the web to figure out what the answers are. That is not what they do. They create a copy at all times of the web in memory so that they can efficiently answer your question. If I want to get someone to look over my health data and tell me, for example, should I really get a stent? You know, are my arteries so occluded and there are so no other choices that I can't just go on a diet and a workout regime? I need to have all my data together. I cannot do that if I'm going out to every site. And this, the, the old Markle Foundation architecture, which I'm happy to say I was able to convince you guys to modify, actually was designed that way, that every hospital would talk directly to every hospital and bypass the consumer. The point of Intuit is what happened in the financial world and what should happen in the health world is the consumer became the aggregator. The consumer is the one person who did actually own their financial aid and could give it to anyone else and no one else. A bank cannot arbitrarily give all of your financial data to anyone else because they don't have it. If you want to give all your financial data to someone so that they can look over your shoulder and tell you can they reti you retire with dignity, only you can do that. And that is how it should work in health. So I just, can I just add one? I want to give one more example of um, some aggregated data. A few years ago, Aetna bought a company called Active Health Management. They collected all the pharma prescription data. And so for each individual patient, it wasn't he decides he wants to query the use of his stent. Every, every time new transactions would come in, this system would run expert rules over the data, and they would say, oh, look, John Jones, he's already taking this and this and this, and now he just got a prescription for that. That could be dangerous, and they would send a warning to the doctor. Uh, my preference would be that they would also send the warning to the patient. But that's, that's the purpose of these aggregated systems. It's not that they are just dumped in a database and they're inert, but various kinds of applications are running through them all the time, looking for anomalies, dangers, people who haven't done things they should do, people who are doing three different things they shouldn't be doing together. Or are they just not compliant? Yeah, yeah. I said I, not I, taking I their... I just add one note to that when When I was talking about not aggregating data, um, I Health Vault and all these things have have signed up to be consistent with the framework that I was suggesting to you. But Health Vault, with someone's personal data, still doesn't have all the other data that is needed in order to, I mean, it won't have drug interaction information and all these things necessarily. And 
It uh, should. It, can. it should. Uh, right, but but you're ne I guess the point I'm trying to make is that um, our objective shouldn't be one massive enterprise that pulls together all the data. That if we don't have a Google that has all the healthcare data in the country, that we can't succeed. Um, we're more likely to assure people that privacy is protected if the data is pulled together when it's needed. Well, we can debate that. Hang on, Steve. Sally, go ahead, and then Matt, I'm going to come back to you. Go ahead, Sally. Steve, hang on. Go ahead, Sally. Yeah, um, you might just Sally Greenberg. Do you want all three of us to? Why don't we start with Zoe and work down, and then Matt will go to, <laughs> if you remember the question from way back when. I think my, my best is on sugar pressure. <laughs> Um, let me tackle a little bit how consumers can improve their health with information technology and then a little bit about the costs. And um, the, Today, most consumers are aware that with everything else they do in their lives, whether it's learning how to do a Rubik's Cube or finding out about schools that might or camps for their kids, the internet is a tremendous source of information. But in healthcare, it really is a very limited source of information, even though it's one of the top topics searched, because people can't relate it to their own experience and they can't use it to manage their own healthcare in a very effective way. And more than 50% of consumers have chronic conditions, one of the conditions that I articulated earlier. But they aren't able to communicate with paraprofessionals in their doctor's offices, nurses or whatever, when they have questions about their own health care. They're not reminded that they haven't renewed their prescriptions, so they're not complying with their medication regimes. We know, for example, that two years after a heart attack, only 20% of, of patients are still on beta blockers, but beta blockers are the most uh, significant way to avoid a future heart attack. And if consumers are getting reminded by their doctor or their pharmacy that they haven't been taking their beta blockers, they're more likely to live longer, uh, to understand why it is they need to keep doing this. Um, so I would just say look at the various ways that you use the internet for everything else in your life and understand that it can be used to vastly improve your health. Um, if we are able to improve people's health, then we will reduce costs because people won't have hospital readmissions for another heart attack or complications from diabetes. There's a radical disparity, for example, 
uh, racial and ethnic disparity in diabetes management. Whites are much more likely to manage it, much less likely to face complications from diabetes. Um, if we can use, you know, own, there is no divide in who has cell phones in this country. And if we can use cell phones to deliver people reminders to check their insulin, to go to the doctor's visits, um, to check on their diabetes, to improve their diet, not eat things that are, are making their diabetes worse. Most of this is type 2 diabetes. Um, we can help people improve their health, but also reduce the cost from the emergency room visits, the complications, the amputations, the things that just don't need to exist and shouldn't exist. Um, so that's, you know, a stab at what's in it for consumers. Can I just make a comment? Everything that you're talking about today, we've been doing for the last 10 years. Well, that's why I said we know how to do this. It's not... No, I think Steve's comments were helpful. I mean, I think Zoe's comments were exactly on target, and I can only amplify them. But what's in it for the patient? What's in it for the consumer? There really are two things. Number one, they will do a better job managing their health. Um, you know, the rest of it is, is, is the detail. And the detail is that the data is there holistically about that consumer. And I'll start with meds because it's the simplest example. Then they can have tools to warn them if the meds that they're on are inappropriate based on either the combination of meds, their lab data, or just new, new, new concerns that they have in their health. For example, if you become pregnant, there are meds that you're on that you should no longer be on. No one is usually warning you. Secondly, companies like Dan Bernstein's can step up to the front and remind you when you're not taking your meds. And compliance is a huge problem in that cost that we talked about earlier. Um, so one of the benefits is just the consumers have better tools to manage their health, and so they're going to be less likely to get sick. And that, that is only going to happen if the data can be aggregated and so it can be then delivered to the tools to that. The second is Steve's comment, though, which is the doctors will do a better job. The doctors don't do a good job today in part because they only see a small slice of your health because you see many doctors in the course of your health career, even many doctors in any given time, if you have a complicated disease like diabetes, and they have no ability to collaborate and work together and correlate. And so the second benefit that we'll see is the doctors will do a more effective job caring for you. Well, that alone are two very compelling benefits. Now, the issue is, will the health IT bill deliver those two benefits? So that was, a good, that was your third question. The way I've been talking about that with a bunch of people. Um, there's a guy called David Kibbe who's been driving what I call a clinical groupware organization around this. We think you start very simple there. We think you start by giving the doctor a printout that the practice administrator can give them before each visit that just summarizes. Here's the history in the labs. Here's the history on the meds. And here are the key issues that the computer thinks you should worry about or key questions. You know, why is this person not on beta blockers? Or why is this person not getting ACE inhibitor or what have you? It's just a printout. It does not change the workflow. And then the second thing is the doctors spend a fair amount of time educating the patients in a very routine way 
about what they should do for whatever they treat them for. So you've saved some time up front because the medical history is sort of pre-prepared for them. On the back end, the doctor saves time and does a better job for the patient because the patient who's afraid in a doctor's office is not doing a good job of internalizing what can be a complicated protocol for managing their health once they leave. If instead they can just go online and then with maybe the help of their daughter-in-law or son or whatever, look at what they're supposed to do, interact with it, and get detailed interactive help, that's a whole different experience, and the doctor didn't have to do it. They've, instead of doing the routine work over and over again, the computer is doing that. And so now they can say, just go online. Your instructions are there. They're interactive. They'll ask you questions. They'll keep an eye on you. If something's going wrong, they'll let me know. And there, boom, you're out of the office in 30 seconds instead of five minutes that the patient didn't internalize anyway. So the benefit to the doctor, properly done, is time savings. And that time savings translates into having more fun, frankly, because doctors are paid to think. And that's what they went to medical school for. They went to medical school to use their extraordinary talent to actually have insight into what's wrong with the patient. And they don't get to do that very much right now. Um, I'll briefly, it's hard to be third because th th these are all really good points. I'll just add a couple more. Uh, Zoe talked about the really great thing, which is simply reducing not just the care, but the need for care by providing more upfront maintenance and, and prevention and, and better treatment that limits the need for treatment later. It's not very interesting to me, but the fact is also better information systems will help make fraud more visible, and that could save something like 6% of costs. It will also just increase efficiency, duplication of tests, all this kind of stuff. Uh, from the point of view of the consumer, you didn't ask just what the benefits were. You asked, could the consumer understand all this stuff? Uh, it's, you know, that's where the market does a really good job. There are lots of little companies competing to make front ends to these databases, front ends to these EMRs, front ends to all these records more intelligible so that you can understand what they're saying. And two, the great thing is, again, it's not a record that you need to go look at. It sends you information, reminders targeted to your particular condition so that it's, it's something active. Again, it's, it's like mint or wasabi. It says, you know, this week you got almost up to your spending limit or, oops, you, you went over your spending limit, you should know this. In the same way, it will remind you of stuff you didn't do, so it becomes very personal. The other thing that I think is really important is just as people now join all kinds of online groups, they will join health groups. And so they will encourage each other to avoid the donut, go running in the morning. Uh, they're going to compare their health data with the people they choose to compare it with. And they will engage, if they're men, in friendly competition. And if they're women, most likely, in friendly collaboration. You know, hey, Joe, I, ate, you know, I ran 10 more miles than you. Or, Susie, you can do it. We know that. Go. Uh, this kind of stuff will happen online, and it's funny, but it's real. Industry 
structure and very difficult fly by problem. And everyone, everyone who's studied healthcare data research knows this is the case. And you know, the natural way we have practice variation, and we have all kinds of different, different uh, expenditure, which is based on things that are, even if you put the world's greatest IT systems in, if you didn't also change the payment system and change the supply side structure of healthcare, you're not going to affect the overall cost. No, I challenge that remark. Just imagine as a thought experiment, as a thought experiment, that we rolled this country back to the OBC levels of 1986. Only 20, just wait, just 23 years ago. Where would that money, that money wouldn't be getting spent. It doesn't matter how expensive. If you build the big palace on the hill, they'll figure out a way to no. spend it. No, no. no you wouldn't have the heart. This. If we spent 35% of the healthcare dollar on tuberculosis, we don't spend any of it on the tuberculosis now. We found something else. And we'll keep finding other stuff until we, until we do something about the supply side. And, all this, uh, and by the way, I run a conference called Health 2.0. I love the stuff they do. I think it's wonderful. It improves the life and health and every quality of consumer care. All the stuff that we're talking about in terms of getting uh, better information with doctors, it's a, result, it's a terrible system for confusion of patients. But we've got to say that if the first thing President Obama says in the press conference, the first press conference about healthcare is, we're going to solve the system by, by putting in more IT and solve the cost crisis, we're setting ourselves up for failure. I, I almost got a weekend sort of doing it in the background. And I, look, for, look for change to happen later. Yeah. I agree IT is not going to fix everything. but. Some car companies have gone bankrupt. It is not impossible for things to get smaller if there is really no need for them. So the essential question isn't whether IT is going to fix. Yeah, it's whether it will be fixed. Okay, there's a lady in the back. Go ahead. Well, what's more complicated is the healthcare system. Right. That's well, the difference. Is, but, every industry has its own but I come out of the finance world too. It's well, identical. It's, you know, just apples yeah. and oranges. It's not okay, in the back, there's a question. Thank you. And we're getting very close to the end. So if the question over here, and then there was one here, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to break. But go ahead. I'm curious about um, answers and solutions to helping the small primary care or the small practice doctors get expertise at a field that helps with micro-care and small practice doctors. How are you going to provide technological support when the system crashes or something goes wrong and you've got you know, tons of jobs in the world of pharmacy who you know, really don't need Well, that was my comment about Model T Ford versus modern technology. I mean, one of the things that I am astonished when I see is practices installing computers in their offices. It's as though you were installing phone exchanges in your offices. You don't do that anymore. You know, the phone company does that for you. And if it doesn't work well, you switch phone companies because that's ridiculous. You, you know, the phone messages wouldn't go through. Um, there, if you build an online system, uh, honestly, those systems are architected to stay up. Now, that doesn't mean they stay up every minute of every day. Google's had some notable outages, but notice what happens when they do, and they've been 
probably a total of 20 hours in the last two years. It's headline news. When they're out for eight hours, it's on every, it's the top of the news everywhere. When the EMR goes down, it's installed in the doctor's office. You know, there's no one who knows how to deal with it. There's no news. There's no nothing. Or, or put differently, you know, it is rare to put it mildly, that these systems go down for more than a couple of hours at a time because right. these companies fail when that happens. Last question, and then we're going to thank our panelists. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, one comment. Uh, in Britain, the primary doctors are paid to be in people health. Right. Uh, and uh, the second thing is, I go to my own doctor, and I've been doing him for 20 years, and he sees the five or six people, and there's a, a massive record as big as that wall behind you. How in the world are you going to multiply that by every practice and put that information out of it? It's cheap. It really is. <laughs> It, honestly, After the panel, I, I, he will answer that question it, honestly, for you. The, I mean, the cost of storing this that information really has become negligible. Then the next question is, how are you going to educate the doctors? You, you, That's you next said, year, you, 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 said, you, said, you said the most important no. thing up front. The best thing about what, what you described was the incentive for keeping people well. The yeah. biggest outage in our system, and this goes back to what Matthew said, is that we do not provide funeral, payment funeral. for keeping right. people well. Right. All um, right. I, Esther I've gets an, the last word. I have another answer, uh, which is perhaps not polite, but they say it in science. We will fix that problem funeral by funeral. <laughs>